Okay. Um, so what you're looking at right here is uh, the world's first uh, CAD system for nanoscale engineering. Uh, I'm going to come back to this. What I'd like to do is give you a little bit of context and background on uh, what we are doing at NRX. Um, the, uh, uh, Joel just mentioned Engines of Creation written by Eric Drexler, who now works for NanoRex. He's our chief scientific advisor. Uh, he's been working now with the company for three years, and the year before that, he was one of our scientific advisors uh, on our board of, of advisors. <clears throat> but uh, what's interesting about this is that the story really begins back in the mid to late 80s. At this time, I had recently graduated uh, with a degree in computer-aided design. I got a job with General Motors and soon after that with Sun Microsystems. And my job with Sun was to travel around the United States and help software teams for CAD software port their programs from mainframes and microcomputers to the Sun workstation, which at that time was uh, a very powerful desktop system running Unix and was becoming popular as an alternative, a, a less expensive alternative for CAD workstations. So I was you know, going over to uh, Computer Vision, Prime, SDRC, Unigraphics, all the big names, meeting with teams of programmers and, and you know, helping guide their development roadmap to the Unix workstation. It was during this time that I learned about this book and I read it and was really um, inspired by it in many ways. One thing that uh, you, you hear about or you read about in this book are the possibilities of advanced nanotechnology. The ability to create atomically precise products will bring about tremendous change you know, mainly for the good, but also possibly for the bad. But it's a very powerful technology. And um, he talked about some of the applications in the book. And one of the ones that really caught my attention was advanced nanomedical devices. And I love this illustration. It shows a little uh, robot floating in the bloodstream and taking, taking a sample of a blood cell. It might be, you know, sensing the environment, uh, you know, and sending an email to the host, you know, the, the person and that this thing's floating into them, giving them an update on their health. You know, if a, if a diabetic is getting high blood sugar and eating cake, you know, the nanobot would send them an email when their blood sugar was getting too high, warning them of, you know, the danger. And, uh, and, and ideas like this, the possibilities of this, really intrigued me. Again, I was you know, doing uh, software development, uh, doing a lot of computer graphics and, and CAD work at the time, and it occurred to me that one of the things that was going to be a key enabler for advanced nanosystems was a CAD system unlike any that had ever, had ever been developed before. Um, the, the reason for this, uh, one of the key reasons at least for this, is that when we're at dealing with nanoscale systems, we're at, the, at that realm or that domain of atoms and molecules. You, you're no longer working with continuous material, metals or plastics, things that we traditionally model in which are continuous material, doesn't work anymore. And what's more, as you know, Joel was alluding to, the properties of materials at the, at the nanoscale change in fundamental counterintuitive ways. And to have software that's able to deal with the digital nature of matter at the nanoscale, as well as to embody uh, the, the properties, the chemical and physical properties of materials and the vast array of materials at the nanoscale is a daunting challenge facing uh, developers of nano engineering programs. So this idea of developing a nanoscale engineering program really was a dream. I, I mean, I, it, it just turned me on. I had a passion for it. I, I couldn't get it out of my head. And later, I quit uh, my job with Sun Microsystem. I started a small company called Netrex, which was an internet security company. And to make a very long story short, that became phenomenally successful. I was approached by a company out of Atlanta, out of Atlanta to buy my business. I sold it. I retired for a few years. I'm young. I'm ambitious. Got full of energy and ideas. And this idea 
about doing a nanoscale engineering program uh, became you know a real tangible idea, a real thing that I thought I could do. I could certainly afford to, you know to to start looking at this. So what I did, I called Eric Drexler up out of the blue after really thinking seriously about this for about a year, and I. I uh, posed my idea. I said, Eric, we're never going to have advanced nanosystems without a CAD system like this, or like the one that uh, I had in mind. And he agreed. And so we met, and together we put together a crack team of very good programmers, hardcore programmers, some of the best I've ever worked with. And we have been working now for four years. In fact, we just had our four-year anniversary on April 5th. And we're getting ready to make our first announcement for our first product uh, on April 24th at a nanotechnology conference in Utah. So we're just uh, about two weeks away from a major event for us, and I'm really excited. And I want to show you what I'm all excited about. So this is um, a screenshot of an early version of our program. This is actually about a year and a half, two years old. Um, but one of the things I love about this image is that it really conveys the, um, the idea of nanoscale design, modeling and design. Here we have a worm drive. Anybody who's worked with a CAD system will recognize it right off the bat, even though it looks kind of funny with all these spheres of different colors on the surface. And what, what these spheres are are actual atoms. We have an atomically precise uh, model of a worm drive and the little cylinders, if you can make them out at the bottom here, are virtual motors that we use to simulate this system, this gear system. And I, we, our software actually can run numerical methods on this, namely uh, molecular mechanics and molecular dynamics simulations, to see if this thing would actually perform in the way we wanted as an engineer. And so um, what I'm going to show you next is a little animation of, oh, and real quick, I just want to point out that this uh, worm drive is actually a subassembly of a larger assembly of a pump. This is a pumping mechanism. And again, you can make out uh, components of this. You have the ports coming out, uh, these pipes coming out that uh, are, are the import, uh, input and output ports for feedstock molecules. And in this yellow area, this chamber in the middle, we're sorting molecules by size and type. And on the back side, we have another port where the, the actual molecule that we want, the target molecule, uh, gets spit out the other side. And it's all driven mechanically, <coughs> mechanically by this uh, worm drive uh, at the top of the system. And uh, just to show you an animation of at least the worm drive assembly, you can see the two counter-rotating worms driving the worm gear in the middle, and that extends down below to that chamber and inside causes a, a, um, a curtain to, to turn and, and processes the molecules and sorts them uh, by the right size. So it's a theoretical system. We certainly can't build this, but it's a real interesting study. Um, and and, uh, and um, th this view of it allows you to kind of see the business end. Here you're actually seeing the, the threads interface with the, uh, the, the rows of teeth in the gear here in the middle. So you can really see what's happening. Everything else is really just uh, bushings and, and casings to keep everything kind of uh, glued together. And here are some other animations, uh, movies that I created of other uh, gearing systems, molecular scaled gearing systems. And you'll recognize them right off the bat if you're a mechanical engineer. You have a differential gear on the left. The idea is that the input uh, gear or the pinion uh, rotates in one direction. The output uh, shaft rotates in the opposite direction. Uh, here in the middle we have a speed reducer gear and on the right we have a planetary gear just like you have in a common household electric screwdriver. Um, and so these are just really fun, exciting things but you know there's a real problem with this and I want to hit my button here. Is, is how do we build this stuff? And that is a challenge that we haven't, you know, nobody has an answer for, especially for these kind of very specialized systems. But 
When I started the business four years ago, I had confidence that the technology for creating atomically precise systems like this was going to come about and we could get started, at least on creating the modeling system and all the simulation and design software to, to support it uh, for these kind of advanced systems. We could get a head start on that, create the foundational code and build on that. And as technology, as the manufacturing technology for creating atomically precise systems became available, that would help direct our, our development in those very fruitful directions. So. Um, where, what's the state today of atomically precise manufacturing? Um, well, organic synthesis, that's been around for hundreds of years. The problem with organic synthesis has typically been the scale, the, the size of the products. Once you get beyond a, you know, a few hundred atoms, you, you, you just run out of gas. And, and chemists, this is you know, the field of organic chemistry, they, they do a wonderful job creating drugs and other uh, atomically precise products, and drugs are just that. Um, they, they are limited by their size. Supermolecular chemistry and material science has made tremendous advances. We have things from this area like carbon nanotubes, which I'm sure you've heard of. Dentromers is another class of uh, supermolecular uh, products that, that are very interesting and have all sorts of different applications. We're beginning to hear about things like quantum dots. I'm sure these uh, kind of ring a bell with you. All of those cases, though, have certain issues with them in terms of using the, the product from the, the, these chemistry syn synthesis techniques for these products, we, we cannot, although we can, can, we can actually make these things, we cannot make them to atomic precision. It's kind of like growing grass. Uh, the way that we make carbon nanotubes, it's, it's like growing grass. You get all sorts of different size blades of grass and they come, a, they come in with a mower and they cleave, cleave the carbon nanotubes and you get a bunch of carbon nanotubes in your hand, but they're all different shapes and sizes. But they have you know they, they are pure carbon and they all have the common you know uh, uh, cylindrical shape to them uh, and, and that's kind of the state of that Stan scanning probe uh, manipulation are able to to you know work very uh, detailed on on species and and kind of fit things together through uh, mechanical forces and, and arrange atoms in certain arrangements but it's very tedious work and very slow going nothing you could do on a on a mass scale the, the, the real exciting area, though, is this fourth one, biomolecular engineering, or uh, uh, yeah, biomolecular engineering, or, or biotechnology, bioengineering. Um, and in this field, in this realm, we're talking about uh, uh, proteins and DNA synthesis. And this area is beginning to really uh, explode in, in, in very interesting and exciting ways. And so I'm going to get into that. Without getting into the details now, I want to talk, uh, show you a few things. Um, so, so the area that I'm going to focus my, convert, my talk and presentation today on is the area of structural DNA nanotechnology. And what researchers are doing in this area are using DNA as a vehicle for constructing structures, very complex and large structures. In fact, uh, the largest structure that I know of right now, that uh, a unit uh, building block that they've built is about a, a half million atoms. Uh, all exactly where you want them, all in, in this aggregate you know, structure that will self-assemble spontaneously into a custom designed shape or product. So um, to understand DNA uh, uh, nanotechnology, we have to do a little bit of fundamental you know, backgrounds. Uh, so what you have on the left here are the four nucleic bases. Um, you have guanine, cytosine, uh, adenine and thymine and the, the, the G and C, the guanine and the cytosine are, are a pair and they, they mate to one another and adenine and thymine are also um, paired together through these little bonds, these red lines that I've drawn between the, uh, certain atoms in those, in those bases, that those are hydrogen bonds. They're weak bonds that bring the two molecules, um, that, uh, that attract, it's a force that attracts them together and orients them in just this way. 
the bases are just one fragment of a nucleic, uh, a, a nucleic acid or a nucleotide. Um, and you can see the three fragments here. I've drawn them and, and kind of created a block diagram around each group of atoms that, that make up the fragment. So we have the base on the right. That could be any one of these four, okay? So that could be, uh, if it's cytosine over there, then that's a cytosine nucleotide, um, et cetera, for the others. This, the deoxyribose, is the sugar structure in the middle, uh, and that's always the same in a nucleotide structure. And then the phosphate linker, this thing on the, on the top left, is the thing that, uh, that actually connects the, uh, the individual nucleotides together into a long chain. Okay, so now we understand that. Um, and I'm just, th this, uh, let me, now that we kind of understand that, this is just a diagram, and those in the back, I apologize, you probably can't see this real well, but this attempts to, to kind of flay out two, um, two strands of DNA and show how their complementary bases come together there in the middle and create the, the duplex. I like this slide a little bit better. Um, what you have here are, the, are two individual strands of DNA. Um, and you can kind of make out the nucleic acid bases. Each one, of, each one of these is a nucleotide. You can kind of see them group, and they look like beads on a string, and they just kind of dangle around uh, and, and float around in, in a fluid, and they're looking for their complement. And when they find their complement, they create the duplex structure. And so here what you're seeing are two complementary strands of DNA. At each position along both strands, you have complementary bases that have formed hydrogen bonds, and they create that helical twist. That's just all the forces that, that naturally cause that structure to form. And then on the right, what we have here is a reduced model of this atomic model of DNA. And this is something that we invented at, at NanoRex to help modelers of structural DNA uh, nanotech structures to, to use. And I'll be demonstrating this. Uh, in fact, I would like to try doing that now. So um, I'm going to break out of here. And um, so this is... Our first product, it's called NanoEngineer One. Um, I just want to orient you. Uh, anybody who's used the CAD program will recognize this right off the bat. It, it's very similar to uh, um, ProEngineer or SolidWorks, uh, Alibre. They all have this kind of layout in common. You have the common blue area, that's the graphics area where all the fun happens. That's where you do all your interactive modeling. Along the top and the, the right edge, you have your common commands in, I, in icon form. The very top, we have a menu bar. And then on the left, we have the model tree. And as we create our structure, our, our nanoscale uh, design, uh, each command will, or, or object that we insert or, or build in the model or in the graphics area will be represented by a leaf node in that model tree that we can interact with. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go right into the DNA builder and I'm going to lay down a uh, strand of DNA and you can see uh, this looks very similar to the things that I was showing you in the, uh, in the slides. Uh, this is the reduced model of DNA. It's called the PAM3 model. For every base pair on the, on the helix, we have three atoms. You can see them. There's one there, one there, and one on the red here. I'll zoom in here so you can really see it. Um, and, uh, and basically, that represents a base pair of DNA. And putting a big string of these things together, you, um, you, you have a, a duplex. So now what I can do is select the segment there in the middle, the axis. I can edit the properties and I can now change the size of this uh, interactively. So um, this is uh, just showing you how I can take a, a strand and um, interact with it, change its length, kind of like a solid modeling program. A parametric solid modeling program has this ability to interactively change uh, a parameter or feature of, uh, of, of an object. 
So we've tried to follow that paradigm in our software. Um, the other thing that we have, I can select the two strands in this duplex, uh, either through the property manager on the left or I can select it right here. And again, if I bring up and edit the properties, I can create, uh, I can extend one end of this. So if I go down here and grab this handle, I can now extend just that one strand of DNA. Okay, so um, the, the only other thing I'd like to mention is down here on the left, what you're looking at is, is the actual uh, DNA sequence. And I can go in here and edit that and type in all the letters of DNA available, you know, A, T, C, and G, and assign the actual sequence for the, this duplex. And when I, assigned, when, when I assigned that to one strand, it automatically assigns the complement on the other strand. So let's do that. Um, I'll just go down here and edit this line and I'll just, I'll just start typing in. And you can see what's happening below is that um, it's telling me what the mate sequence is here. So this is what I'm assigning to the blue strand that, I've, that I'm editing and it's assigning the red sequence, the red strand its sequence here. And uh, now I can click done and I have a duplex. So, um, so let me go that, that's kind of a real quick intro to modeling DNA with NanoEngineer 1. I'm going to now go back to my presentation and what I'd like to do next is introduce you to some um, basic DNA motifs and structures that these, this community of researchers that call themselves structural DNA nanotechnologists make, what they actually synthesize in the lab. So one of the structures they make is called the holiday junction and it's a T motif or a cross motif. It's made from four individual strands of DNA. You can see them in the four different colors and what we have are uh, each strand is got exactly one half of its sequence uh, programmed to be complementary with one half of another sequence so that those two strands will mate just in the top half of the strand. Same thing with the green and purple strand here. Um, I've got my colors mixed up, I apologize. But anyway, you get the idea. Each one half of each arm or each strand is complementary with exactly one half of one other strand. And when you mix these things together in solution, they will spontaneously combine into a motif. And this is a very famous structure called the holiday junction. And, uh, and sci scientists have been doing this, synth synthesizing this structure since about the mid 80s. This is one of the first structures that was synthesized artificially uh, in solution by, by uh, DNA researchers. What they did next is they took that a holiday junction and they modified the ends of each arm so that the end was exactly complementary with the opposite arm. So when they mix the four strands together, and there are billions of strands in solution, they just through random Brownian motion will find their complement location and they form these grids, these large grids of, of, uh, of uh, structure or lattice. And, um, and uh, anyway, that's uh, something they've been doing now for a while. Um, this is just another uh, quick slide to show you that the holiday junction has two confirmations uh, or associated with it. One is the open uh, confirmation, one is the closed. And I just want to point out that the open resembles more of that open cross confirmation. The closed kind of resembles an H where the two, uh, the four strands involved in the, in the junction create um, two parallel helices. Uh, kind of glued together by this crossover here in the middle. This is the crossover uh, right, right there. And again, I'm showing atomistic models next to reduced models just to kind of give you a comparison for the two. 
Um, and so what uh, a researcher did, a very famous man now, his name is Ned Seaman, he's a researcher at NYU who's considered the father of structural DNA nanotechnology. He took two of these holiday junctions in the closed confirmation and ligated them, which is a fancy word for glued them together to create a very famous molecule called the double crossover molecule. And it's, this is the cornerstone of the entire field of structural DNA nanotechnology. This thing on the bottom. And so what I'd like to do real quick uh, is show you a number of the many different uh, conformational isomers of the double crossover molecule. So I have three of them here. There's actually about uh, seven of them and I just don't want to bore you with all the different ones. A three is enough to get the idea across. But you can see the, that in each case we have two crossovers between two parallel helices, but the, the, if you follow the color of the strand, each you know, strand is colored in a, in a separate color, you can see how the path weaves itself in different pathways. And, uh, and it's, it, it reminds me of knitting. It's almost like you're sewing together these duplexes um, into, uh, into different patterns. This is just another uh, crossover. What's different about this is I've kind of exploded, created an exploded view at the very top showing each individual strand in the, um, in the double crossover junction molecule. And the junction's this little thing kind of sitting at the bottom, the yellow strand. What's happening there is that the yellow strand goes up into the double crossover and is part of the double crossover, but it also comes back, shoots back out and uh, starts combining with itself. And, and that's the junction, this little thing here. And that can be extended, you know, to be very long. And what you have basically is this perpendicular uh, segment of DNA that uh, lies in the plane of the crossover but is perpendicular. And you can build off that. And, and so using all these tools, these ways of stitching together DNA and creating crossovers and junctions, you can create very intricate and elaborate frameworks out of this material. These are just more um, uh, motifs that people have synthesized in solution and they've actually created uh, grids out of these uh, different patterns. So we have a three-fold star on the left, a uh, four-fold uh, four star there in the middle, and a six-fold star on the, on the right. And these create different lattice designs. Um, here's the, the four-point um, four star and you can see it's the same kind of deal with the holiday junction that I showed you earlier, only here we have in each arm of the motif two parallel crossover duplexes, so it's a much more rigid structure and it creates a, a more dense uh, grid or network there. And this is an actual atomic force microscope image of this structure and you can see that these things get very large and in fact I believe on the next slide, this is the, the three-point star up here, and here's a AFM image showing the kind of the honeycomb grid that this structure, this motif creates in solution, and they've actually measured the size of grids made of this. It, it really creates kind of like a film that are one millimeter in, uh, in, in length. And uh, it's just amazing to me anyway that we're synthesizing structures this large with literally millions of atoms in them that, um, you know, where the atoms in the structure are exactly where the engineer or the, the chemist, the, the technologist wanted them. So um, I'm going to stop there and I just want to show you now what, what uh, these researchers to, to design these motifs, researchers sat down with pencil and paper basically on a napkin or they created a little model, a plastic model of this stuff which uh, is very tedious and spent literally months designing that structure and getting it to a point where they felt like they would have a su successful su um, experiment if they bought the material, synthesized the DNA and mixed everything together. With our software, we are showing these guys and they're now, they are now actually using our software. Um, 
that they can model this very quickly. So let me do that. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to create another duplex parallel to the first one and, um, and show you how you create a double crossover, first of all. So um, if I select this and um, edit that segment, I can rotate this duplex around its axis and that lets me move the phase of the duplex into a position that will allow me to, you know, um, establish a you know, the positional relationship and orientation with the top duplex to create the crossover. So, so I've got something um, here. Uh, I, I'm just going to modify this real quick, rotate this, um, and then drag this down or over back and forth and if I grab if I grab this just, and then I'm going to zoom in on this point so what I have in mind is to create a crossover at this point so to do that I hit breaks, uh, break strand I, I nick there I create a nick there and these arrowheads allow me now to um, drag and drop and make a connection to join the two strands together and you can see now I have a, a crossover point right there and if I go over here, I'll need another crossover point. Let's put it right in here. And now I've got a double crossover. And it's really that simple. And if I wanted to make a triple crossover, I'd lay down another duplex down below the other two and do the same thing. Um, now the other thing I'd like to do right now is change the color of some of these strands. It's, this is getting confusing, so um, a very, very common thing to do is just uh, change the colors so we can tell the difference of where, you know, kind of the beginning and end of strands. So, um, so now what I'd like to show you are some features of the program that really make working with very large structures easy. So, um, so far we've been working in what we call ball and stick mode. There are other uh, um, display modes or rendering modes that come in handy for different reasons. This is CPK, which you find in traditional programs, and we have tubes mode. But we also have this one we call DNA cylinder. And here what we're doing is rendering each duplex as a cylinder and we can follow the individual strands and we can know the difference between them through the colors and we can um, you know, rotate this and kind of look and see uh, you know, what's going on here. So um, what I'd like to do next is take a time out and show you a couple of really exciting things kind of to show you what's happening the state of the art right now in the in the field so I'm gonna quick whoops I did hit the wrong one so this is a DNA de uh, tetrahedron that was synthesized this year this was published in science in, in January and what you're looking at is a uh, computer image that was re generated from a bunch of slices of, of these uh, images on the, on the right. And this is an AFM image here of this structure, but it's a rigid tetrahedron. And there's literally billions of these things, and they're about 25 nanometers on a leg. Each leg is about 25 nanometers, 20 to 25. And, um, and uh, what's wonderful about this is that these are atomically precise products. Not only was he able to make a tetrahedron, but the researcher Chung De Mao at Purdue University who did this um, also created an icos a dodecahedron and an icosahedron using the same technique. And it's just wonderful, the, the purity he's getting here, the, the, um, the yield, the synthesis yield, uh, and it's really inexpensive to do this. It's just really amazing. Um, this is another uh, a model, I don't have an AFM image of it, uh, but this is just another structure that was one of the very first 3D DNA structures that was synthesized back in the mid 90s by uh, Ned Seaman at NYU and you hear you know is a nice side-by-side uh, -side image of an atomistic and a reduced model 
And then really the, the most exciting thing I think happening in the field is with regard to DNA origami. So what, here what you have is a structure that will spontaneously uh, self-assemble into these very complex large shapes of pure DNA and you can, you can design these things uh, you know, to, to, to whatever really um, you want. And the way it works um, this is, uh, th these are the six images that Paul Rodeman, he's the researcher at Caltech who, who published this work. He uh, modeled six different origami shapes and he then ordered the DNA and, and actually synthesized them. And these are the AFM images on the bottom, so he really did this. And uh, the way it works is that what you have is a long viral uh, DNA strand. It's a, it's a genomic single strand of DNA from a M13 virus. And it's exactly 7,249 bases long. And he synthesizes hundreds of these little short staple strands. And what the staple strands do is they have exactly uh, one half of them or, or a third of, of their length that's complementary with one little portion of the genomic DNA. And they kind of pinch together this long strand of DNA and fold it into the de desired shape. And so what you're seeing here is kind of a three-stage process of, of the synthesis um, process for creating origami. And um, here's a little close-up that I drew showing what's happening at the, uh, sta w with each staple. So th you have the crossover point where the staple crosses over to another totally different section of the uh, red strand, the genomic strand. And, um, and you, you get this. And here's another, this is actually um, an image of a very simple origami structure that we did in NanoEngineer 1, and I'm going to show you this in a second. Um, but what you have here is a reduced model, and we've zoomed in on one section of it, and we've blown it up to show you an atomistic model of just that section of it. And you can kind of make out the colored strands are the uh, staple strands, the real short ones. The black strand is the scaffold strand that weaves itself back and forth through the entire structure. So let me um, show you how that how this works. So we have in NanoEngineer 1 a uh, part library and instead of sitting here in what would take a you know an hour or so to model that, that uh, small origami structure I'm just going to drop it in. So I'm going to close this and I've got a part library and there's uh, down at the very bottom I'm looking for this particular structure and it's going to show up here I've clicked on it it's fairly large and so it's going to give me a little preview here it's hard to hard to see but um, basically let me just uh, zoom out a little bit and if I double click over here I should get a origami structure and there it is. So um, you can imagine from my earlier demonstration how you would go about modeling this in the software and now the next question is okay how do I sign the uh, DNA sequence so it turns out that w this black strand if you can make it out that weaves itself all the way through the structure um, is, uh, is complementary with, ex with every uh, staple strand in there. So if I assign it its sequence and we know that from the DNA sequence of the viral strand of DNA, we know its exact sequence, I can select the scaffold strand, go to properties, and right down here is the sequence. So if I go into um, load sequence, I can load it in from a file. So let me go in here and um, let's see. Okay, I thought I put it in there. Okay, so here's the M13 strand uh, text file and it's just 
you know, a bunch of letters. If you were to open it up in a text editor, it would look just like this. And here we see, you know, our ATAC or GC, TAA, etc. And by loading that sequence in the editor down below, it assigns all the um, base pairs for all strands in the structure. So uh, what does that buy us? It, what it does for us now is um, lets us order the DNA that we need to build the structure. And th th simply the way we do that is we click on a command called order DNA and there it is. You can actually cut and paste this file um, into an order form on a website from these, there's a number of companies that will uh, that will synthesize unique, you know, custom strands of DNA to order and mail them to you. And when you get it in the mail, you take it to the lab, you mix all the strands, excuse me, all the strands together, and take a sample and look, put it under the microscope, look at it, and you've got what you designed. So that's, in principle, what's going on here. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's a good question. Uh, so the question is, you know, when you get this in the mail, what, what is it like? Well, here, I'll show you what you get. I'll, I'll show you exactly what you get. So what this, this is a plate, a plastic plate. It's got uh, 96 holes in it, 96 wells, and each well has a unique strand in it. So you want about, you know, 200 strands to make an origami shape. So you end up with about two or three of these plates of all your strands, and they ship them to you in the mail. They're, they're packed in dry ice to keep them cool. But when you get them, you put them in the fridge, and when you're ready to do your experiment, you take them out, put them on your wet bench, and you start pipetting all the strands out of these wells into a mixing tray, and you mix them together. And then the, the thing that I kind of breezed over very quickly, and here, this actually is my daughter. My daughter sent the sized uh, my company logo out of DNA <laughs> and here she is she, she she's uh, pipetting uh, the DNA out of the plate putting it into the mixing tray and that's what's going on over there she pulls the trigger on the pipetter to spit out the DNA from the different things then the last you know at the end she uses a single tip pipetter to mix all the strands thoroughly and then she's putting sa the sample into a tube all the strands into a tube. Then you take it to uh, the thermal uh, cycler machine um, and mix all the materials together. So, so what, basically, here's the recipe for creating origami. You take your staple strand mix, which has your hundreds of strands that Erica, my daughter, just mixed together. You take the M13 scaffold strand, that's in a little tray, and you mix that in. You add some uh, magnesium buffer and distilled water. You mix it up really good and then you stick it in a little plastic tube and stick it inside this uh, thermal cycling machine called a, called a PCR machine or a poly polymerase chain reaction machine. And what it does is it heats it up to almost boiling point, you know, 90 Celsius, cools it down at a rate of one Celsius per minute, and after about an hour, you are ready to take uh, a, some of your sample, and here it is showing again, that's the Nanorex logo on the right, and you put it into an atomic force microscope. So that's what this is on the left, and that is connected to a computer that can do the actual topographical imaging of the structures that you're, sample, that you're looking at. And again, this is my daughter preparing the atomic force microscope f with a sample. And, um, and actually, let me, I've... Tell me, did she win the So so this is actual the actually the image that she got. This is the raw data on the right, and we use some image processing to really draw out the three D image. And these are actually two tiles, two origami tiles stacked on top of one another. But you can make out the Nanorex logo. We we didn't have enough room on the surface of the tile to 
add the little molecule at the top of the logo. So we just went with the crown and the X, you know, the X person, and uh, and that was uh, something we did um, last well, two summers ago now, and uh, so that's that's. Um, See, I've got 10 more minutes, so what I'd like to do, yes? Okay, so you do this with DNA, uh -huh. is that because DNA is easier to do it with right now when you're learning? Because we can actually program it to self-assemble end solution into structures, very complex structures that we would like. So, so is the long-term gain well, yes, absolutely. So th that's a very good question. The question is, do you plan to do something more than DNA? Because DNA as a material for a final product isn't very good. You know, it, it, once you get it out of water. And, but the key to remember here is that it's a great vehicle for nano manufacturing, for you know, uh, orienting other materials. Uh, into the right arrangements in, in orientations to build the composite systems or use it as a framework for other things to come together and that's exactly what researchers are beginning to do with in, in this area. Um, for instance, we now have uh, cases where they've taken gold particles that are about fi five nanometers in diameter and they are able to mix in DNA strands and the DNA will, will actually wrap itself around the gold particle and then find its complement in a, in a structure and, and arrange rows or white, you know, little pathways of gold particles all in a row. Uh, we're starting to see this with proteins as well, that uh, uh, these guys are adding proteins with DNA. Uh, proteins will dock themselves in, in the major groove. Let me just show, tell you what I mean by that. There's a, there's a physical property of, of DNA that I have not talked about and we can look at it um, and see it up here. Let's, let's take a look at this picture. So if, if, you, look, if you study this carefully, you'll, you'll, know there, you'll notice there's kind of this major groove um, right there in the middle. And what happens is there are certain proteins that like to dock themselves right in that groove. And this actually happens in the cell, in, in our cells, in our bodies, that certain proteins will nat have an affinity for a certain location in the uh, major groove of a DNA structure. And it turns out that if, you know, depending on what that sequence is in that major groove, one protein will have an affinity for it while another will not. And so these become, you know, little, you know, kind of toe holds that we can use for gluing structures, namely proteins. But then remember, proteins are really uh, nice for attaching other stuff. Uh, you know, uh, carbon nanotubes, for instance, and even DNA. Now, there's a whole field of study that's emerging called DNA-wrapped carbon nanotubes, and these guys are doing amazing stuff, and we, they are now at a point where they believe that this will become a very um, fruitful way for sorting carbon nanotubes. I mentioned before that the way that carbon nanotubes are made, it's kind of grown like grass, and you whack it off the plate, and you you, you got a bunch of carbon nanotubes, but they're all different sizes and shapes. Well, if you're after a particular what's called chirality of, of DNA that has a certain you know electrostatic potential associated with it, or a, you know a um, uh, um, uh, there's a word I'm, I'm missing, but anyway, it, it turns out that if you mix in certain str types of strands of DNA, certain sequences, they will wrap themselves around certain types of nanotubes, and then the other end that's dangling of DNA could, might attach itself to a surface. Um, and then you wash away all the carbon nanotubes and all you're left are with uh, DNA wrapped carbon nanotubes and all those carbon nanotubes are of the identical chirality. And that has uh, tremendous potential for things like nanoelectronics and, uh, and other types of uh, devices, nanoscale devices. So, uh, so that's certainly something that, uh, that we want to do. Um, with my remaining time, I'll just show you some fun things to, that we can do in the program. Uh, I personally am excited about the potential for nanoelectronic applications 
specifically DNA and carbon nanotubes. So I've shown you the DNA uh, builder. I'm going to show you a carbon nanotube. So I can just lay down um, on the left. I can change the chorality of a carbon nanotube. Um, for those of you that know about this, uh, you know this is how you do it. You just go change the the N and M uh, in it, um, vectors, and you can uh, change the endings on a carbon nanotube, and you can just lay one down. And uh, there it is. And if I zoom in on it, you can see it's an atomically, um, you know, detailed model. And I can now click on it and. Um, edit and change its length. Let me just grab. So uh, this is um, this is just uh, another example of a material that we've support you know added support for in the program um, and it's very popular with scientists. Uh, we also have a traditional molecular modeler. I'll just go in here. We're going to have to zoom in so we can uh, start to see. I just laid down a carbon atom. And you'll see the little red endpoints on this. These are free valences in, that allow me to build and extend the structure. And um, so we can, we can model structures at the atomic level and at uh, you know reduced levels of abstraction, and uh, so um, that uh, that is pretty much uh, what I had to show. I, there's a lot of a lot of stuff here in the program that I'm not showing. I just wanted to give you the highlights. And, and like I said, uh, we will be making an official announcement on the 24th. The last thing that I'll, I'll uh, say about our program is that it will be uh, open source. We are making it totally available. And the reason we're doing this is that we want to stimulate um, uh, you know, contributions from researchers, from the scientific community. We think we've created not just a great modeling tool, but also we have uh, worked very hard to create a uh, you know API, a set of APIs that allow others to develop plugins to work with this. Um, and we think it's going to be a really big hit, especially with uh, the scientific community. So thank you for having me.